complicated, you know, man. I got down with Rubik's Cube, man. You like talking about a blue red, man. Then you get to one side, then like man. All right, John Slaughter, welcome back to the show. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm uh, glad to uh, make my third appearance, so I guess that makes me a regular. Yeah, definitely. You and I speak quite a bit off air, and I- I'm-, I'm looking forward to this because our previous episodes have been primarily about literature. You know, you're, you're a writer. I enjoy you know what you produce quite a bit, but this is going to be a little bit more of a personal autobiographical show. Right. We're going to redact details, of course, for OPSEC reasons. But you were a, a combat veteran. You were in the, in the Marine Corps. And I think that that's something that should be discussed. You, know, you have a, a good background in, in philosophy and literature. And I think that the way that you talk about your experiences is, is both interesting and edifying. So it would probably be best to start at the beginning with why you decided to to sign up and and what your expectations were with that yeah of course um i like a lot of uh, young men in our sphere i'd imagine um figured out at a young age that i wasn't that was at least relatively I i was smarter than most of the adults that i grew up around right so i figured out really quickly that I didn't have to try at school. I could just kind of wing it and I could be a a C student, a B student and pass. So by the time, you know, high school ended, I was, uh, you know, graduated in the middle of my class. I wasn't, I didn't have a, uh, a scholarship or anything like that. And when you're in that position, you know, you only have so many options. And I come from a family that is not a military family uh, in the sense that, you know, that, that wasn't something that everybody did, but historically every, conflict that had come up my family had fought in and and also growing up as a child i had always the only things i ever wanted to be was a firefighter cop you know fighter pilot something like that so being you know 18 years old and looking ahead there's only so many options so i tried college i did a semester of college goofed off didn't really care and the one thing that appealed to me that was left was like well i could go into the military because i've always kind of wanted to do that I figured if I'm going to do it, I, w- I want to be, you know, I, w- I want to go as hard as I can. Because, you know, if you join the Air Force, you're always going to wonder, well, could I have made it in the Army? If you join the Army, you kind of wonder if you can make it in the Marines. So I joined the Marine Corps, um, uh, like, what was it, probably, like I did one semester. So I was still 18 at the time when I joined. And there was also, there was there was some patriotism in there, you know, because I was old enough to have remembered 9-11. Uh, I was in eighth grade when it happened. So that was fresh in my mind. Uh, the 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 pro-America Toby Keith stuff was still prime time all over the place. So there was also a sense of pride in doing something like that. Um, and so, you know, I joined up, uh, went to boot camp. And uh, I mean, that's that's really how I got into it. It was it was largely due to the fact that there's only so many options for young men and there was, there was some patriotism there. And I think to add to that, I would say there's something that Junger talks about in, in storm of steel where he says, you know, growing up in security, uh, we had always had a yearning for danger and to the, to experience the extraordinary. And I think that was probably at the core, the biggest driver, you know, what was boot camp like for you? I mean, I know you're a pretty physically fit guy now, but one of the things you you hear from some people is that that's, you know, very challenging on one hand, but also sort of a, a rewarding process of sort of proving yourself. Is that something that you experienced? Yeah, it it is. It's um, even though I, I was in good shape when I went, it was extremely physically demanding, uh, largely because of things like sleep deprivation. Um, it's not you know, if you play high school sports at a, at a decently high level, it's not going to break you necessarily, right? You know, the the requirements for the PFT, you know, for a perfect score is, is uh, 20 pull-ups. And if I remember right, I think it's a uh, 20, 21 minute, three mile and 100 sit-ups. So it's nothing insane, right? But it's the, uh, the idea behind boot camp is to break you down, right? To sort of get rid of all of your, your, your personal 
ticks, your personal beliefs, your your individuality to, to shed you of all that and create one unit, right? And that's that's where the stress comes in, right? It's constantly being, you know, running on five hours of sleep or if less, um, being harassed 24-7, being yelled at 24-7, uh, putting you under high levels of, of stress. They'll ask you to do simple stuff, but they'll scream at you at the top of their lungs the whole time you're doing it. And you'll have four or five grown men yelling at you. So a task like tying your shoes that you would normally do all of a sudden becomes a massively stress-induced event. And you start forgetting how to tie your shoes, right, as, as an example. Um, and that's the hardest part is just the level of stress they put you under. And then towards the end of boot camp, uh, at least in the Marine Corps, you go through this thing called the crucible. And it's about three days of just constant go, 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 nonstop. You're running, uh, you're doing different exercises together. You're, you march an extremely long distance. Um, and at the end of that, you receive your, your Eagle Globe and Anchor. And that that's sort of the hey you're a marine now, you've made it. That that's the hardest part. But you know I made the mistake of watching Full Metal Jacket right before I went to boot camp, so I was terrified. Um, and I coped with that through through humor, which is not the right way to do it because uh, if you if you laugh a lot, you get in a lot of uh, a lot of trouble, which I found out the hard way. So not to turn this into too philosophical a direction too quickly, but. You know, one of the things that I've been, been speaking about to a lot of my guests, specifically Athenian Stranger and George Bagby, is, is this, you know, liberal idea of the individual, right? That you are kind of in and of yourself, already have everything you need. You know, you don't need to be told anything. You're a, you know, sort of a, a noble savage corrupted by society. And I wonder if one of the reasons that, you know, so many guys in the military become right wing you know, that sort of without these liberal institutions, you know, any group of, you know, military men kind of tends towards, you know, right-wing authoritarianism. Do you think that, you know, there's some of that kind of built into how boot camp is structured, where you are sort of being forced into a hierarchy? No, yeah, that, that I would say that's 100% accurate. It's, it, you're forced into a hierarchy, but you also, you learn very quickly that, um, that that hierarchy is built on tangible results, right? Like this isn't this isn't uh, some DEI type deal, right? These people, you know, at least at least at the squad level, at least with the the NCO uh, core, these people have earned it, right? And even in boot camp, you know, you have your you have recruits that are given uh, special positions, right? You have the guide who's the head of the platoon, you have your squad leaders, and they earn it, and you watch them earn it, right? And so I think they're, the reason they lean towards that is because not only are they forced into the hierarchy, but they see, the, they see what a real true hierarchy is like when it is earned, if that makes sense. So what happens to you after boot camp? What's the next step after that? So after boot camp, so when I joined, um, I originally wanted to be an infantry guy because, again, you know, I, a lot of guys join. Um, because that's what they want to do. They want to experience war. Um, and that's why I joined, but I scored high on my, my ASVAB, and my GT. So they tried to, to sell me on a bunch of technical jobs, support jobs. I didn't want that. So I finally ended up um, with my contract being as a forward observer. So after boot camp, the Marine Corps has this philosophy that, that every Marine is a rifleman, right? So if you're in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, once you graduate boot camp, you go to your MOS school, right, for your job. In the Marine Corps, you if you're not an infantry, if you're not going to be a grunt, you go to what is called a Marine Combat Training, or MCT. And that is a, uh, I think it's two months, maybe. It's a watered-down version of infantry school. The idea being that in any combat zone, any Marine, whether they're a cook or, or you know, a radio tech, you can grab them and throw them on patrol or throw them out into the field because they have the basic skills necessary. So immediately following boot camp, you go home for like three days and then you're, you're sent to Marine combat training. You do that for two months and then you're off to your MOS school. So I did my time in a uh, combat training. I went to my, my MOS school out in Oklahoma. I did that. And then from there, once you graduate, you go to what's called the fleet and the fleet is just the average everyday Marine Corps. That's, um, all you're doing there is you're getting ready to deploy or you're training. That's it. And so what is, what is your first deployment? 
how fast does that turn around and where do they end up sending you? So for me, um, I was in Afghanistan within, I think, nine months of hitting the fleet because the unit that I was assigned to, you know, you don't get to pick that, right? So I was lucky enough to get stationed in, in Camp Pendleton. And the unit that I was being assigned to was being thrown into the Helmand province of Afghanistan, right? Um, the FOB that we ended up at is very, very small. So I won't, uh, I don't want to dox myself, obviously, but um, that was during, so that would have been 2010. So, you know, if you look into the, the, the war in Afghanistan, you'll notice that about 2010 to, I think, 2012 is the big push where there's a, there's a surge of troops going in. So the minute that I hit the fleet, you know, my unit was already working up to go. And um, I actually turned 21 the day I got to my FOB, you know, because when you go to Afghanistan, you, you fly there, you go to this this giant base called Leatherneck. I mean, it's massive. And then from Leatherneck, you know, you, you're going to go wherever you're assigned to. So for us, we were sent to this FOB out in the Helmand province, which was in, which mostly had either had very little contact with coalition forces or had had no contact at all. And uh, our job was to establish uh, police stations, uh, army bases, any way to basically get a foothold of this new Afghan government into these these you know rural isolated communities. So let's pull back a little bit. What is Helmand Province like? Like, what's the topography there? Was it different than what you were expecting? Well, so the, the Helmand Province is it's a large province in the south of Afghanistan. Um, it's where most of the Marines uh, were sent, right? Um, a large portion of it is desert. It's open desert, um, which is what we trained for because, you know, you go to 29 Palms uh, right before you deploy and you usually do something called Mojave Viper, which is just desert training. So the, the vast majority of Hellman is, um, it's wide open deserts with these small villages um, and it's surrounded by the, the foothills of, I think, what, what turns into eventually the Hindu Kush mountains. So in the Northern part of the province, it gets a little mountainous, but the Southern part, it's, it's just open desert until you hit uh, Pakistan essentially. So what does that first day on, on the FOB look like? Like what happens when you show up there? So the way I always describe it to everybody is uh, if anybody's ever seen the, the film pitch black uh, when they first land on that planet, Right. There's 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 moon dust in Afghanistan. We called it moon dust. I don't know what the technical term is, but it is the finest dust you could imagine, like sand. And you hit the ground and it just it, it flies up everywhere. It goes everywhere. And the sun was brighter than you know anything I'd ever seen. So it literally almost kind of felt like stepping into an alien world, like you're completely blinded. There's there's dust everywhere um, and it is, it is completely desolate. So landing there, you know you it's it's such a quick transition right because you're only on a plane for a small amount of time right so we were on the plane for i think 30 something hours and we stopped into um kyrgyzstan and you're there for two days and then bam you're in afghanistan so in less than a week you go from you know or in my case you know southern california um to all of a sudden being in what feels like an alien world like this giant massive desert um where like i said you you have moon dust you have not, there's nothing as far as you can see, and it's just surrounded by giant HESCO barriers and Constantina wire. So it's a, it's a, it's a strange experience, I guess I would say. So what is your first, and again, I'm not a military man, so forgive me if I get the terminology wrong. What's your first mission? What's your first time you're actually kind of outside of that forward operating base? So like I said, the, the the FOB we were on was only about, I think, if I remember correctly, it was like three acres squared. It was very small. Um, and our entire mission there was to secure this 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 paved road. It's one of the few paved roads in this in, in Helmand. And so what we did, you know, to kind of give you an idea for the day to day is the way it was set up is you were in squads. Right. And you would be assigned to go on patrol. And if you weren't on patrol, you're on what's called QRF or quick reaction force. So you might patrol for eight hours and then you have another eight hours of QRF and then you have your time to sleep. And then in between that, you get assigned to guard duty, which you're just standing on these these guard posts watching, you know, to see uh, if the Taliban is going to approach or anything weirds going on. So 
the first uh, the first experience outside of that fob is, you know, we we mounted up in in our vehicles. We did a uh, a mounted patrol out to this route that we're securing, and we set up posts along the route about every half mile. And these posts were were small. They were surrounded by HESCO barriers with one vehicle, one armored vehicle. So it was usually an MRAP or a Mat V. And we would, you know, they would take four guys, put you on that vehicle. You'd have a uh, a squad weapon, so usually a 240 or a saw. Then you have a couple riflemen. You have a radio. You have your vehicle, and you would sit there for a few days, right? You would just sit there eating MREs. You know, watching trucks go back and forth, keeping an eye, making sure no one's planning IEDs, nobody's doing anything weird. Um, you know, you kind of interact with the locals. They'll come up and and ask for stuff, and and you know, the kids will throw rocks at you and just try to screw with you. But it's mostly that's the first experience. It's just it's just sitting there in complete sort of boredom, playing cards with your buddies, waiting for something to happen. So you have a a couple kind of amusing anecdotes about the Afghan civilians. So what was your kind of preconceived notion of what the civilians would be like? And then was that borne out in reality or is there sort of a, a change in how you viewed them? So I, the only preconceived notion I have had of Afghans was that I assumed that they were similar to other, you know, Middle Eastern ethnic groups. Right. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I thought they were, they were somewhere, like Iraqis, right? Or maybe Iran, where they're fairly advanced. I didn't realize when I got there that these are people that are, are, for all intents and purposes, are almost Stone Age, right? They have like no, most of the villages have no electricity. The only vehicles they have are these small motorcycles that are better than, that are a little better than mopeds. Um, they, they live in, you know, mud huts that in most cases, they don't even know how to operate. Um, and so or how to build and so when you get there and you start interacting with them you realize very quickly that you're almost dealing with children as far as like their capacity to do anything like they're they're functionally incapable of doing most things and they're not the smartest people in the world um and so it was very sobering once you start working with them and you know for an example to kind of show you what they're like as far as like the competency level we would take the afghan army with us on patrol most of the time right and every single time we would go on patrol we would have a friendly fire incident in which they would shoot each other on accident now for us if that happened that's a big deal you know you have blue on blue when you you have friendly fire you know it's a serious issue for them they would just laugh it off we we'd be on a mounted patrol you'd be they would be in their vehicles in the back of the patrol and you'd get a call over the radio. We had to stop because one of them would discharge their AK into the other one's leg while you're driving. And then any attempt to try to like, to, uh, to discipline or enforce it was just met with laughter and it was, it was a complete joke. Right. Um, the other biggest, the shock factor, I think that people often don't understand is the, how prevalent, um, I guess homosexuality is in Afghanistan and how much they like young boys, which if anybody has looked into Afghanistan, you may have heard of the Bacha Bazi boy issue, which is essentially what it is, is that they, they, they choose to sleep with young prepubescent boys for fun. Right. Um, then oftentimes you'll see a convoy of truckers like truckers we have, you know, in the U S but they'll, they'll convoy together. And there'll be, you know, five or six grown men, each one driving a truck, and there'll be one 10-year-old with them. And so when I first got there, you know, you ask, well, what's this kid doing? And nobody wants to tell you. And then they finally tell you, and, and you're completely just, it, it's almost hard to believe, you know. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a shocking experience, to, to be honest. What was the, because I, I would imagine that there was some kind of institutional pushback from a bunch of you know, American guys there, but was there any kind of order down the chain of command about what you were supposed to do in that situation? Uh, we were supposed to ignore it, um, just like all the other corruption in Afghanistan, right? Um, you know, you're in these areas, you, you have these districts, you have these district commanders, and they would, you know, constantly, they, they would backstab you, they would, um, 
they would sell out to the Taliban the minute they could, you know, if the Taliban offered more money and it didn't matter, you were just supposed to ignore it and continue with the mission. And that was the same attitude that was applied with, uh, the, the Bacha Bazi boy issue, right? It was, Hey, you look the other way. You don't say anything. Now, all of the guys were pissed about it and wanted to do something, but you're put into a position where you're not allowed to. Um, and, and I guess you could say it's a moral failure on a lot of, a lot of us that nothing was ever done, but nobody ever acted on it. We know we all were disgusted by it, but we were told, look, it's just their culture. You have to ignore it. I mean, and to be fair, we never witnessed these incidents occurring, luckily, but we all knew what the game was, you know, but, but it was, it was pushed under the rug. That had to have been demoralizing, right? Especially in the, in the face of sort of the rhetoric we were getting at home. Did, did you ever feel some kind of conflict with that? Yeah, um, actually, I remember uh, distinctly realizing at one point, you know, early on, and I had I had this thought of, of it just hit me that what are we doing here? Why are we here in the first place? These people, for one, are no threat to any Americans. They they can barely function on their own. So I'm not protecting anybody. Um, I'm establishing these these outposts, these police stations, these. Uh, uh, army bases and for what for them to you know you realize really quickly they, they should they just sell out to the taliban like i said you know we would pick up high, high value targets um and those guys would be right back on the street within a week because the police would just let them go for money um you know you you see the the incidents the way they treat uh the young boys the way they treat their women all of it you realize very quickly like it, it becomes you become very nihilistic towards the the purposes for being there, right? The cause of the war, whatever, what have you. The only thing that drives you from that point is the fact that, you know, and this again, to, to pull back to younger makes this point that like men don't fight for their country. They fight for, for their, the, the men to their left and their right. And that's really the only thing that keeps you going once you have that realization. So let's get into that actual fighting portion of it. Right. So what is the first time you, you make contact with the enemy like? So for me, um, I was on patrol and we took small arms fire. Uh, we were we were heading down down a road, just doing our normal patrols. And uh, for what I noticed was I noticed the dirt kick up in front of me. And then I, then, you know, I hear the the sound of machine gun fire from far, far off. And it took a couple seconds, at least in my mind. Uh, for me to realize what was going on. And, you know, this is this is a highlight to the importance of training because immediately your training kicks in, right? And you 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 hit the deck, you look for cover, and um, you just start returning fire, right? It's almost, it's muscle memory, right? Because you've, you've drilled this so many times, right? Um, and in that particular incidence, in most incidents, they are engaging you from a significant distance, right? They're not trying to get close to you. They're trying to to just in in that incident they were just trying to harass us with machine gun fire so nobody got hit right but in that moment you know they opened up an rpk and it happens extremely quickly you know the entire incident you know probably only lasted four or five minutes that was it because the minute that we tried to establish fire superiority which if you don't know is just we're trying to put more rounds at them than they're putting at us so that way we can have a fire team maneuver and try to outflank you know, that squad or whatever is attacking us. So by the time we even established fire superiority, they broke contact and got out of there. So it was a very quick incident, but it was one that, you know, I, I remember, like I said, distinctly, I remember the, how it started. And then I remember it being over and I remember standing there and be like, Oh, that was, that was crazy. Your adrenaline's going. Um, nobody gets hurt. So it's kind of a, an adrenaline high and everyone's excited. And then you realize as, as adrenaline wears off, I remember looking down and I was like, Oh, I, I, I pissed my pants. Right. Like, like I was terrified more than I ever even knew, but in the moment I didn't even realize how scary it was. So a lot of, a lot of the, the combat that you do experience is, is that it's just, it's, it's them trying to ambush you. Um, and then them breaking contact really quickly because they're aware of our air superiority. So you don't have a lot of, you know, long extended battles. What was, and forgive me if this is an indelicate question, but 
that's that's your first experience of of combat per se was there any was there ever anything that was more kind of face to face than that or was it all kind of long distance you know pot shots almost no we did have um some more intense combat um on my my second deployment in particular um we had to we were going into areas that americans had never been um and we were trying to establish and these were areas that were taliban controlled so we had a, a bunch of different operations that we did where we went into these villages and tried to secure them um and so a lot of times they would know we were coming and so they would they would dig in they would put you know they they would put ieds inside the buildings inside the doorways they put pressure plates and they would also dig in fighting positions um and so we had a couple of a couple of encounters where we got uh we got into these villages and we're trying to take them and these guys these taliban guys you know they're they're tougher than people realize you got to remember like you have to have some balls to be willing to to fight the u.s military with nothing but some rpks and rpgs and, and ak's and that's it and in your sandals by the way right and they dug in and fought hard and we ended up pushing into the same buildings and we're you know we're exchanging fire you know which you know in america you'd have sheetrock walls these walls are made of wood but that's the only thing in between us you know and um one of my one of my friends actually ended up getting um he got an accommodation for this but he was going to peek around the corner and when he did all of a sudden he sees the end of this uh this ak come around the corner and he went to shoot his gun, his rifle jammed. He grabbed the AK, pulled it from the guy and ended up beating him with it. Um, but that's how close uh, in some of those incidents they were in, uh, they, we were with the enemy. What is that like, you know, being kind of door to door with someone? I mean, it has to be incredibly intense. Um, I, you know, it's weird. It's, there's two different ways I think to look at it, right? There's the after, during the moment, and, and if if none of your buddies get hurt, it is the greatest adrenaline rush you've ever had in your life, right? There's there's like a high that comes off of it. Um, but in in reality, and most of the times when when things go south, which they usually do to some capacity, it's extremely terrifying. Um, one of the scariest things in the world is is going house to house, street to street, so to speak, right? Which is just what urban combat is, because when they are in that house and you're stacked on that wall and you're going in, everybody knows what's going to happen. There's no, there's no question about what happens next. Once that door is breached, they know you're going to kick that door in or you're going to breach that door in some capacity. You're going to toss a grenade. That grenade is going to go off and then guys are going to come through the door and they're ready for that. So it is, it's, it's best way I can put it is it's, it's extremely terrifying and you have, you just, you have to, you have to grab a hold of whatever you can that's inside of you and just say, Hey, it's what we're doing today. And you just go in and you just pray to God that they, they can't shoot well or that you you're quicker on the trigger than they are. I assume in that, you know, obviously you ended up you know, being in close proximity to, to men, to men dying. Do you remember the first time you, you saw either a dead body or, or someone actually expire? Yeah, um, the first the first uh, dead body I ever saw was at, they were Afghans. Um, it is I remember the the shock to me was how they didn't look real. It was like looking at a wax figure, like with like instant like they hadn't been dead but maybe a couple of minutes, and the life is instantly drained from them. Um, it, it almost it does it seems surreal. Like it doesn't look like you're looking at a person. It looks like you're looking at like I said, like a wax figure, it looks, it looks fake. Um, and it's not the same, you know, and I grew up hunting, right? So I, I've shot deer, you no, know, all kinds of different, you know, game birds and stuff. Uh, and nothing was the same as like seeing a completely lifeless person. Um, even your, even though they're, even though they're your enemy and in the moment you're, you're pissed off and angry. I think everybody, or at least maybe I'm projecting my own thoughts on it, but everybody is 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 outside they're projecting this machismo that they're they're like oh yeah this is you know we got him whatever 
But I think internally, everybody is sitting there looking at this and going like, this is a, this is a person, this was a person. And you're having to cope with the fact that this is not something that you were there. There's nothing that can prepare you for it until it happens. The scariest part about that though, is within second, third incident, it's you're completely desensitized to the process. Do you, and again, I, I'm speaking delicately about this, uh, you know, just to, just to be discreet, but do you remember the first time you were involved in taking a life? Um, yeah. I mean, the weirdest thing about it is that because most of most engagements happen at distance that there's some plausible deni deniability, right? You, you know, you're, yeah, you're putting rounds down range and they're putting them back at you. There's, it's very difficult to say, well, I'm, I hit that guy. Right. Um, for me, because I'm a four, oh, because I was an FO, I did, you know, a lot of times when we got, you know, engagements with the enemy, um, if things started to look south at all, I was calling in air support or I was calling in artillery, you know, because before you go on patrol, you, you know, like, Hey, we have, you know, we have predators on station. We have Harriers on station. This is your air support, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of the times there was a giant disconnect for me because I know I, I just called in this airstrike. This airstrike took out this, this, this building or took out these guys and, you know, blew them to pieces or cut them in half right that i did that but it doesn't feel like you did it because you didn't you didn't you didn't physically do it right does it make sense like you didn't actually see but you weren't looking him in the eye so to speak exactly yeah you're not looking them in the face you're you're you know you're you're taking fire you call this in you give the coordinates you know you tell them hey time on targets this boom explosion goes off everybody gets rattled everything's done you do what's called a battle damage assessment so you go up to the to the enemy location where you just hit you start doing your your bda and there's these there's these dead guys right and most of the time they're they're cut in half or or um for whatever reason we used to always joke i guess it's it's a, a gallows humor right we used to always joke that for whatever reason the bombs always blow people's pants off right so you get there and you're kind of like laughing about it but like it, it it's hard because I guess I, I guess the best thing to it, it's kind of a hard thing to to quantify or to talk about because everybody thinks they know what that's going to feel like and you don't know what it's going to feel like. The problem is a lot of times, and, and I hate to admit this, it wasn't as hard as you think it's going to be. It's actually easier, and I think that's just because of the because you're not looking them in the face, right? This isn't hand to hand combat, um, and I think that was you know if, if that was the hardest part for me was realizing like oh this wasn't hard this was a lot easier than it should than, than i wanted it to be that's one of the things that i think it's interesting in a lot of the books that you know we've read and we've talked about is sort of the the fact that conflict is a part of human nature right and especially if you're a man there's a part of your brain that is sort of built for this and Again, you know, I, I've uh, the closest thing I, I've been in to combat, right, is a couple of fist fights, right? Like nothing serious at all. But there is that sort of feeling that it's like, okay, maybe this isn't good for my soul, but there's a part of your lizard brain that sort of rewards you for that. It's like, yeah, you're doing what you're supposed to. Is is that something that you you felt at all? Oh no, yeah. Um uh it's it's um it's kind of addicting to be honest um not necessarily the the taking a life part but just the entire process the like i said the the adrenaline rush post any engagement um the excitement of it the living on the edge um like you said i think that 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 kicks part of your lizard brain but it's it's a very primal way of living um that obviously is something that we have to have or we wouldn't have gotten where we're at right if everybody was terrified to do these things you know we wouldn't be here so it's it's evolutionarily beneficial to to feel that way i think but um i i think it's just it's i don't know it, like i said it's difficult to to really quantify to somebody who hasn't ever been there before because we all dream about it right 
it, it is, it's kind of like meeting your heroes, right? Because when I was a kid, you know, I used to always fantasize about, you know, whatever it was, little round top or pickets charge or, or something of that effect, right? I'm always like, oh, that'd be so cool. And then you get into it and it's a completely different experience. But at the same time, there's there's an excitement to it there's you're living in the moment and you're and you're enjoying it and even though it's it's terrifying you kind of walk away um with like a morbid a morbid enjoyment i guess so you know it being combat right things go both ways so what was the first time that you know you you, you were around someone or, or one of your friends got hurt what was that like well, so the one of my best friends, um, you know, he he got killed on deployment with us. I wasn't there when it happened. Um, I got news of it afterwards. They went on a separate patrol, and I remember uh, they came. They said, you know, they told me what happened. Basically, they took they took small arms fire. Um, they they responded to it, and he went to take cover in a uh a, like a like a cutout i don't know if it had been a an old uh a dried up dike or whatever but he jumped into it and they had anticipated this so they had laid small ieds inside some of these fighting positions or places that can be used as fighting positions so when he jumped in i mean he laid straight onto an ied and that was it right it it, it um it, it blew him apart right and that was that was um it was hard right because you because up until that point, you know, we I had had people I I had known somewhat that had been killed, and you know, because you're not you you deploy with your entire um, your entire battalion, right? So you're not with you know I'm with this company, you know, people in other companies who've been killed, but but nobody in yours yet, or nobody you're close to. So that was the first time it was somebody I knew personally, somebody I was actually really close to because um, we used to hang out all the time um, back in the states, and you you get about five minutes to grieve because you don't have the luxury of, you don't have the luxury of time, right? Because, Hey, guess what? You're going on patrol next, or you're going on QRF next, or you're going on this. So you get angry, you get pissed off and you're just hoping that the next time you go out there, you can get back at them. Um, for us in particular, because of the way that that engagement went, our guys had to egress and get out of the situation quickly. So we had to go back, right after them and uh we actually had to we had to uh put his remains in a, in a bag and take them back to the the fob which was extremely difficult you know because then it's it's you know it's kind of like being a kid and the first time you see you know one of your grandparents like in a casket or something it, it's it's a surreal ter like experience to to realize like this used to be somebody that I was close to. Um, but it, but it, it, that's the dark side of it. Right. That's, that's also the danger of the type of combat um, that Afghanistan offered. Right. Because a lot of the times we came out of on top, you know, nine times out of 10 and you get excited, you get used to it and it's fun. And then, you know, um, and then the chickens come home to roost basically. And you realize like, Hey, this isn't a game. Um, and this could be you next this could be your friends you know i had a sergeant of mine that um was the first person i was with when when they were killed and he was a hispanic guy and i remember just thinking like it, we were loading him on the helicopter and looking at him and thinking like he was just so white that's all i could think right because he's, he's a hispanic dude and all of a sudden he he what he was like a, a sheet and that was it it was over and it was um you almost it's almost like a dream i guess is the best way to describe it what is the the impact psychologically of, of something like an ied right where it's not enemy fire there's not even someone around something just you know explodes is that something difficult to deal with mentally yeah it, it's um you know it, you can read any any war memoirs and pretty much every soldier Marine, whoever will tell you that any form of indirect fire is the most terrifying thing in the world, right? Because there's not a lot you can do, um, with IEDs, any type of mines, anything like that. It's, it creates this massive amount of paranoia, you know, guys coming back from Iraq used to have the issue of worrying about trash on the side of the road because they bury these IEDs in trash. 
and you become accustomed to being terrified of it. Uh, and Afghanistan, it wasn't, that wasn't really the issue. It was, um, they, these people were very clever. They would find ways to create, um, IEDs that had very little metal in them. So the metal detectors didn't work or would, would not pick them up or barely pick them up. And so you just, you know, for example, uh, I had to set up a, a post on these, on, uh, on these two mountaintops. Right. And we had to hike, I think it was about, it was three or four miles from one to the next. And it was all through mountainous terrain and the Brit, the British were there before us. And what they had done was they had taken a bunch of garden hoses and hooked them together and laid out a path. And they said, look, don't step off this path within more of a couple feet because there's mines everywhere. Some of them were old Russian mines. Some of them were from the Afghans. Um, and that the paranoia of having to, at first, because at first it's paranoia, right? You're terrified. You're like, I don't want to step off this. But then complacency comes in and you just don't, to be honest, a lot of times guys just don't care anymore. You just kind of shut that part of your brain off and you're just like, well, if it happens, it happens. But the initial part is just, you know, imagine just having to worry that every step you take could be your last. And then eventually you just get tired of worrying about that and you don't care anymore. So there's this ongoing conversation culturally about PTSD. And you and I have talked about this at length off air. And so I'm curious, what do you see? What do you see in that, right? How much of this is kind of basic, you know, the traumatic experience? How much is this new thing we're calling PTSD? And and how much is something else from your perspective? So I think that there are there are incidents where you have guys who have legitimate, you know, sort of these stereotypical, you know, PTSD, you know, shell shock, combat fatigue that, they, you know, that we talk about where they were in extremely intense situations that that caused them to have, like I said, that stereotypical PTSD. But I think most of the cases, it's a combination of a couple of things. I think one is, and this is something that I dealt with coming home was you go from this environment where, like I said, you're living on the edge, everything, everything is in the moment, right? Um, you're surrounded by your, like the best friends you'll ever have, right? Cause you build this camaraderie, um, people you can trust, you, the world makes sense to you. And then all of a sudden you're thrown into the real world again, right? You come back home because, you know, you don't spend any time. The, the transitional period is very short, right? You're, you're on a plane, you know, boom, you're back in the States. And I remember for myself personally, standing inside of a uh, grocery store and I was in line and just watching people and thinking, I don't want to do this. This is, this is stupid. What is the point of this? Look at all these people, you know, just, you know, walking around, doing nothing, being morbidly obese, just completely, you know, engulfed in their life. And you're like, you think, I don't want to be a part of this. This is boring. This is terrible. And I think for a lot of guys, it's that you realize that 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 purposelessness all of a sudden hits you, right? You used to have this purpose. You used to have this, this drive in your life. And all of a sudden that all is gone. And what do you have to look forward to, right? Is this what I got to look forward to the rest of my life Is, is shopping at, you know, the grocery store and paying bills. And I think a lot of PTSD or what we're calling PTSD is purposelessness that is magnified by the fact that when you come out of a combat zone or you come out of the military in general, you have a real purpose and a drive and a meaning and the things you're doing, even if, even if when you're in Afghanistan and you realize that it's all BS, right? That everything you're doing is really a waste and that it, it doesn't matter in the long term. There's still an element of purpose to it that you can, that you can, you can derive personally. And then that's just snatched from you immediately. And I think that's what a lot of that is. I was talking to a, a good friend of mine who just had his, his first a, a few weeks ago. And one of the things he's mentioned in this, and he's, he's a dear friend of mine, and I've known him since we were, since we were children. He's talking about he didn't realize how purposeless his life was. You know, he didn't realize so much of the time he was just on autopilot. And now, you know, he has this this young son and it's like, you know, even if 
and obviously this is on a much different scale than what you're talking about, but it's like, oh, I, I have something else to live for now, right? I have something that has needs that needs to be done that isn't conditional. And, you know, from what, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but from what you're talking about, it's almost worse to have that sense of higher purpose, that sort of, you know, immediacy, and then go back to just kind of a, an atomized purposeless existence. One of the things that I, I pull from Thomas often, this idea that you know, we, we as a society have a really hard time answering the question, why? You know, why do we exist? And I'm just wondering, do, is, that, is that the sort of thing where, that you're mentioning when you're talking about just like looking around at the general population? No, that's, ex that's exactly pretty much what I'm getting at. Um, actually, it's, it's, it's being a father, right? Because I have two sons um, that kind of pulled me out of that, you know, because my way of coping with it was to just, to just be a degenerate, to party and have fun. Because like, what other purpose is there, right? Once you realize that. Well, as we all know, you know, nihilism leads to hedonism, right? And that was the easiest way to cope with all of this, right? Um, and so I, I lived my life like that for a long time. And it wasn't until I had kids and my first son was born. And I realized like, oh, th there's more to life. You know, there, there is meaning, there is purpose. Now I have something to drive me. But as you said, you know, it, it is, I think it is worse. I think it's, it's, it, it is worse when you have that purpose and you have it taken away from you. It's, it's, it's the same as, you know, um, it, it's the same as any, any, almost any vice, right. Or anything that you've never tasted before and you've thought about what it is then you taste that thing and you want more of it, right? You know, um, <laughs> you know, to, to use a more crass analogy, when you're, when you're a young man and you've never had sex before, right? And you want to, right? That's difficult, but okay, you can deal with it. But once you've experienced that, it's a lot harder to not go back to that because you now know what it's like. And I think, yeah, I think that is, that is the most difficult part because as you said, in our current society, there is no meaning. You know, you had that that stream recently with Bagby and Athenian Stranger talking about nihilism, right? Um, that's something that we're all born into. And I think to get a taste of purpose and then to go back to nihilism is extremely detrimental to people, um, to young men, especially when they get out of, of the military and it's not just that, hey, now I feel like I don't have a purpose, but then they look forward and they go, there's not even an opportunity for me to get a purpose. Every, every opportunity is cut off from me now, you know? And the advice I always give to anybody that I've talked to that's, that's going through that or, or has experienced that is, you know, in the Marine Corps, we always had a saying was embrace the suck, right? Like, just, just embrace it, you know, sort of like it is what it is. It, it's terrible. But you're just going to dig your heels in and and push forward, and that is really, unfortunately, the only real advice I think I could even give if, if anybody was wondering you know, what can they can they do in that situation. So, and I, I'm sorry to keep referencing conversations we've had off air, but you and I have have talked about veterans and and veteran culture, right? And you've expressed some some dissatisfaction, I'll put it that way, with you know how a lot of guys act when they get out. And I don't want this to be you know punitive or in any way kind of a a attacking those guys, but nonetheless, you know, what are the faults you see in, in veteran culture and what do you think that they're missing? So what I see as a fault is I think that at, at the surface level, a lot of it is an attempt, like, again, back to the purposelessness thing, that's the last thing you ever did that mattered. And that becomes who you are, right? You establish your entire personality as I'm the guy that was in whatever, right? I'm going to wear the, the nine line clothes. I'm going to do all these things. And we're all guilty of that to some degree. We all let elements of our personality become, we, we, we magnify them and, and, and we're guilty of of, of defining ourselves off of those things, right? And I think that on the surface level is an issue I have. But uh, the real core issue, I think, is that a lot of these guys have good, you know, to use your terminology, they have good, really good instincts and they mean well. Um, and they look, they, they, they see the problems 
that occurred when they were in the military, especially if they were deployed, right? Um, a good example of this is, you know, if you hear Eric Prince talk about it, he talks about like, well, why did you start a, um, you know, a, a private in a private security mercenary firm, whatever, right? Why did you start this contracting organization? Well, it's because I saw all the the wastefulness and the and how poorly run the military was. So I can do it better, right? And that mentality um, of trying to fix it, I think, is what leads a lot of a lot of the veteran types to go either become libertarians, right? Because they go, okay, well, the problem is just the, the government is inefficient. So if we can just sort of eliminate that part, that's the only real problem. So it's, it becomes almost more of an economic issue. Um, and they're just like, I want to hold on to these freedoms, right? Because tangential to that or, or associated with that is you have the aspect of, or you have the element of the, the issue. I guess what I would say is, is you sacrifice a lot, right? You sacrifice so much, even if you, even if you don't get wounded, you know, Junger talks about like, like no, there's, there's no unwounded soldiers, right? So maybe you don't physically get hurt, but you lose your friends, or maybe you don't even lose friends, but you get a divorce out of it. You don't get to see your kids. You sacrifice so much, right? In the face of all that sacrifice, it is very difficult to come to terms with the reality that maybe maybe you were duped, maybe you were tricked, and maybe on the grand scale, everything you did was was had no real purpose, right? It had purpose for for you and your buddies, right? Your buddies sacrifice for for you to keep living is there, and that's great. But on the grand scheme of things, if he, if you think he sacrificed, you know, for this greater idea of America or, or democracy or what, however you want to frame it, that didn't really happen. Um, and I think my biggest issue is that it, it comes from that. It's like, I, 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 I want more veterans to realize that you, it, it, you were sort of duped in a lot of ways, right? It's not your fault. It's not my fault. You know, I bought into the propaganda. I bought into the, the Toby Keith songs and the, you know, um, you know, the, the, the American flags everywhere and, and what have you, I bought into all that as well. But I also realized at some point that there was trying to hold on to that ghost is not going to get me anywhere. Right. And I think that's the issue. I think it's very difficult for them to let go of, everything and to start to look at the world in a different lens because they're so tied into that you even see that with the ones that want to be sort of your um the ones that want to run for office right i see some veterans that are running for office and i listen to them and all i hear you know and i know they mean well a lot of the times but what i hear from them is oh we can just you know i'm just going to take america back to what what i thought i fought for and it's and and I kind of want to tell him like look that's not there, and maybe it never was. I think that you know when I look at this, and again, not a military man, you know I'm younger than you are, so I have a, a different connection to those American values. But to me, you know that American patriotism that was so much in the culture, you know during the the war on terror, right? Especially among guys of kind of our social class and geographic location. It's sort of a photocopy of a photocopy, right? That that real high trust functional America, you know, where, where patriotism could be gone about unironically. I, I mean, it's really gone. And I don't say that in a triumphant sense. I'm not glad it's gone. But, you know, once something has died, you can't really bring it back. You know, it is something new needs to be raised in its place. And so sort of carrying around, you know, the third version of a photocopy, right, where you, you've lost a good bit of the detail and said, well, we should go back to the second. You know, we can, we can push up the slippery slope and then just pause. Again, I understand the instinct, you know, that, that instinct towards patriotism is a good thing. You know, it is a positive trait to have in 99% of societies. But I look at ours and... To me, I just don't see that as being something that works. You know, I understand the instinct. You know, it's, it's our tradition. I understand that the desire to go back to it. But there comes a certain point at which, you know, something becomes corrupted, something becomes old, and it needs to be at best reborn. 
you know, I'm not one of these guys who thinks that, you know, you, you could make America a feudal monarchy, right? It, it doesn't work like that. You're sort of working with what building blocks you have. But I think that, you know, a lot of guys, particularly guys who are patriotic, who, who have, you know, like you said, sacrificed quite a lot, have a, a huge emotional attachment. And I understand why. But I think that, you know, if nothing else, it's a call to kind of look at the look at the world as it is and not how you wish it were, not as you wish it could be again. And, you know, I, I, I look at a lot of these guys, you know, the, the politicians like you've talked about, and, you know, I don't necessarily see someone who's who's evil, but I see someone who's misguided. And, you know, the people who are in charge of the war on terror, who are in charge of, you know, the American empire, they look at that instinct in you as something to be exploited, right? As a way to get you to do something. And, you know, that that's a something that the left has been on really since the Vietnam War. And I have maybe a, a more favorable view of, of that conflict than some others do. But to me, it's, you know, those the people in charge haven't changed. You know, they're, they're still pursuing the same evil ends. And I think one of the most interesting conversations I ever saw, and I've, I've mentioned a couple times, right, is the Sean Ryan show, which is a very large, you know, highly downloaded show by a you know, ex seal CIA contractor, right? So let's just say that it, it glows. But nonetheless, there are really interesting insights, right? Where things kind of slip through the cracks. And one of them is is the host, right? This this contractor and kind a of secret squirrel guy. And, and another guy who is running for office, I can't remember his name, one of those kind of spec op guys who, who became politicians. And they have this moment in the middle of it, you know, and they're talking about, you know, going to some kind of little village in the middle of nowhere, kicking something over. And they just look at each other and he goes, man, do you think we're the bad guys? You know, do you think we're the empire? And, you know, that 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 rough rubs people the wrong way. I get it. But I think we, we have to look at this and say, like, have we been a force for good? You know, should we even try to be a force for good in that way? But I think that, you know, falling back on the propaganda of a previous era and just saying we need to believe it extra hard, I think that's a losing strategy. So anyway, John, sorry, back to you. That's a lot of me talking. No, no, you're fine. Um, you, you make some good points. You know, one thing I've, I've told a lot of people um, that is related to that is, you know, I did an extensive genealogy project for my grandparents. Um, and one thing that I found really interesting was that the same, um, the same relatives that I had that fought in the American Revolution, their grandchildren, great-grandchildren fought for the Confederacy, right? That to me says a lot because, and it kind of speaks to what you're saying, which is that those guys, they were, there's no way they weren't aware of their family history. But even given that, they looked at, they looked at what was happening and they were willing to, to fight against the thing that their grandparents or great grandparents fought for because they realized, at least from their perspective, that what they were fighting against was, was a, as you said, it was, you know, the photocopy, it's a simulacra of, of what was originally there. It's not that anymore. And they, they, so that had to be difficult to come to terms with, you know, it's one thing to say, Hey, well, like, you know, maybe all this propaganda is just that, and there's no truth in it. And we've all been lied to. It's another thing to say, well, I'm going to fight against that very thing that my parents or my grandparents fought for. My family spilled blood for this. And now I'm going to turn against it. Right. Um, but I think that takes a certain level of it takes a certain level of self-reflection to realize that like this just happens sometimes. And as you said, when something has when something has died, you can't resurrect it. Right. You, you just can't. It's it's done. And sometimes you just have to be man enough to realize that again, back to back to my point earlier, you have to just embrace the suck and realize, like, hey, this is what it is. This is the situation we're in. And we're just going to deal with it, you know. We're we're going to we're going to play the hand we're dealt, and I think. I think the, the true response to it is to to take the step back and realize, like, you know, like you said, you can't. It's not like you can have a, a you know a monarchy, right? That's not going to work. But, you know, I don't want to be tied to this uh, massive, you know, 
federal government. You know, maybe you maybe these guys should push for smaller, decentralized, you know, a something that looks like the Holy Roman Empire, right? Some uh, confederation, which I guess you can't use that term anymore, right? You have to change the name, but a loose confederation of, of states where that loyalty goes back to that. You mean you need because that loyalty has to go somewhere. You know, we all know every man worships something, you know, and if if you're going to be loyal and you have that drive, because let's be honest, it's a certain type of man that has that desire to go fight, to go sacrifice, right? That that type of guy is going to do that no matter what. And if he can't do it in the military, he's going to be a cop, he's going to be a firefighter or whatever. But maybe that energy is best spent at, at your local level and trying to disassociate as much as possible from the America um, as we were growing up and being taught it was, you know, for me personally, I I'm, a, I'm completely okay with looking at myself as being way more loyal to my local community and to my state than I ever would be to the federal government. You know, so John, we're coming up on time. This has been a, a great episode and I, I, I thank you for your, for your insight. If people want to find more of your work, What's a good way for them to do that? Yeah, you can uh, follow. You can go to my Twitter, um, John, John Slaughter Esquire. At tw- I guess it's X now. Yeah, and then there's a link to my Substack on there. Um, I do write some opinion pieces, usually short ones, just commenting on uh, current events. But uh, my main focus is the fiction I'm working on. I'm also will have a story story coming out in issue twelve of the Double Dealer. So check that out when it comes out or subscribe to their, their podcast um, and follow them on Twitter if you want to check that out. And I can confirm your fiction is quite good. I've been lucky enough to be a pre-reader on your upcoming novel. I uh, had some, some feedback and just have to say it, it's quite good. So keep your eyes out for that whenever it drops. I'll be sure to have you back on. As far as my stuff, The Jay Burden Show is available on Apple, Spotify, YouTube anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you want to support us most directly, you can do that by heading over to Axios. Uh, JD's redone the intake process. It's quite good. I recommend it highly. I'm roughly 10 pounds down, all lifts up. And uh, yeah, I can't recommend that highly enough. And again, John, thank you so much, man. And to everyone at home, remember, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night.